What are you up to, Graham? Well, I was supposed to be checking the oil level, but I just realised I haven't got any rags with me. Oh, awesome prep. Cheers. Do we need this Chinese buffet leaflet on the back here? I don't think so. I'll tell you what we do need is some anti-fly spray yeah. or something. Or we need to get you into the car. Alive. Hold on, I won't be long. Looks good. Ah, I'm definitely getting bitten. Right, let's go. Let's go. Off to a cool little MX-5 activity that you have dreamt up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I think it's. I'm gonna. It's like one of the worst features about the car. People say, but I don't think the car even needs it. I'll explain in a minute. Awesome, let's get out of this fly fest. Place. So we skipped breakfast and began the second day of our road trip, heading west and leaving behind Northern Ireland in pursuit of our first activity of the day. Now, that feature I was just speaking about, the component of the Mazda MX-5 Miata, which is so often considered to be the weakest aspect of the car, is most likely obvious to those who are familiar with the Roadster. It's the engine, and the power it produces. Often, the Mazda MX-5 is ridiculed for its slow 0-60 to times and uninspiring top speed figures. And those who haven't driven the car may wonder how it can possibly be exciting with such a pedestrian power unit under the bonnet. But this Mazda's magic is in the handling, and I have a theory that it would be an absolute ball to drive, even if it had no engine at all. To prove this theory, I've come up with a challenge, the car bobsled. We start at the top of a hill, preferably one with a few twists and turns, and then after a push start from our passenger, we have a race to see who can record the quickest time to the bottom. But very importantly, with no engine assistance whatsoever. Will it be fast? That doesn't really matter actually. But even without an engine, will it be fun? Now that's the question I'm looking to answer. All we need now is a hill. And we found one, the Glengesh Pass. Two kilometers of asphalt guiding you down 200 meters of steep mountain pass. It has swooping 90 degree rights and lefts, a momentum gathering straight followed by two tight hairpins before opening up for a straightaway sprint to our makeshift finish line. It was perfect and we had it all to ourselves. So, one quick game of rock, paper, scissors later, it was decided that Richard would have to steer the first run, and he was lining up at the starting point, ready for his push. Oh, I'm nervous. Right, here okay. goes the start line. This little red line, that's what we agreed, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Um, I actually, quite sincerely, good luck. Thank so, you. Well, you'll be with me. Yeah, I know I will, <laughs> but, but, but I, okay. want, I okay. want you to know that this is resting on you. You're in charge here. I'm just pushing and then that's me done. Okay, yeah, I have my foot brake on. Three, two, one, go. Okay, jump in. Oh, flip it. Okay. Okay. Right. It's a, it's a slow and steady okay. start. We're picking up momentum now. We're at 10 miles an hour. Okay. Okay, but it's getting a lot steeper. We're at 15. Flip it, Eck. I'm holding on. We're at 25 oh. miles an hour. Gone past the viewing point. 30 miles an hour. Flip it. <laughs> it's something so scary about not having the car in gear. Yeah. Approaching a sharp corner. Whoa. Ooh. Ooh. A little bit car. of skid. A little bit of a skid there. I mean, we are doing this. On a very wet day. Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. This feels fast. Yeah, we're at 40. That's 40. <laughs> That's 45. Perfect. Okay, I'm putting a, dabbing on the brakes a little bit. Okay. Okay. Oh, first hairpin. First hairpin. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, so I'm down oh. to 30. Big it's turn. It's weird not having to change down gears. Oh, <laughs> that amount of speed. Okay. Next hairpin. Oh, I like the racing line here. Oh, flip it out. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to go past the little. Past Mother Mary. 
Oh. And we're really picking up speed now. now well, it's eerie not hearing the engine yeah, going Yeah, 40 either. miles an hour. No, I was going to say I'll floor it, but I just won't use the brakes. <laughs> okay, come on, 50, 50 miles an hour. Here comes the finish line here. Oh. Whoa. Did you press stop? Yeah, two minutes, 12 seconds. Woo! Flipping egg. That, we could have got faster. I don't know, that felt plenty faster than <laughs> Flipping egg, that's, I can already confirm. I know it's our first run, but this car doesn't even need an engine to be fun. That was. Oh, that was great. What's it called, soapboxing, is it? What to? Yeah, people do um, gravity racing. Gravity which is kind of like, I guess that's what, like what this is really, but bobsled sounds cooler, so I called it bobsled, yeah. but. Oh. And you're just not in, you're not wanting not to use the it. engine now. I'm not in <laughs> <laughs> Why do we need it? Why do we need it? Well, we needed the engine to get us back up the hill. And if I'm being honest, the car's lack of power made it difficult to enjoy the journey to the top in the same manner we enjoyed our journey to the bottom. However, the 1.6 litre unit did soon have us lined up at the start and ready for our second run, this time with myself behind the wheel and hoping to improve on the time of our first attempt. Right, so big push in. Gonna, got the handbrake on, engines off. Well, not off. Okay, three, two, one, go. <laughs> See, she is a light car. Sorry? Oh, and I didn't, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, come, 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 yeah. Okay, nice, nicely done. Oh, cha cha. Okay, okay, here we go. Oh, it's immediately so unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> Why is my foot over the accelerator? It's not coming into action at all. Okay. Oh, breaking already. Breaking already? Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. It's quite We're only at 25, 30 miles an hour. 35. Okay, this bit's quite sharp, right? Yeah, I'm breaking. Quite sharp. Oh. Oh. Okay, this bit's your, your easy bit, and then you're getting into your hairpins after this. Alright. So. Flipping, eh? Pick up speed. You do pick up speed. 40 miles an hour. 45. Okay, you're going faster here than I was, definitely. Oh. But you've got a hairpin coming up. 40 on. Okay. Break in. Break, 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 break. Ah. The one thing about the MX-5 is it's not a particularly quick. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh. A bit of sideways action there. Yeah, man, man. Right, 40 miles an hour. Before I got too scared to talk, yeah. <laughs> I was saying the MX-5 it hasn't got a big engine, therefore it's not that quick. But as a result, they didn't really put on massive brakes or anything like that. No. The brakes are not the best on this car. No. Okay, here I go. Okay. 50 miles an hour. Here's the finish line. Flip it out. Flip it out. Here it is, here it is. Flip it oh, How do we go? Two minutes, four seconds. Oh. I mean, I'm happy because I'm happy I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Flip it. Oh. When can you get any more speed? Can you get under two minutes? It was one hell of an ask, but the progressive handling of the MX-5 NA means you can feel confident in finding, but not overstepping the car's limits. So we once again parked at the starting point and Richard stepped behind the car, ready to push us into our third and final run. Please do excuse the lack of commentary in the car. We were in full concentration mode. Okay, you ready? I'm in neutral. Okay. Handbrake's up though. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Uh, go, go, go. Should I get in? I don't know yet. No, more speeds. That's quite a lot of speed. Okay, go, go. <laughs> Come on. Oh, no. Come on. Right. Oh. Okay. Here we go. Oh. We're up to 15 miles an hour. Oh. It already feels a bit fast. It does feel fast. Remember, can you... you ah! Flip it, egg. That was fun, but very terrifying. This is really terrifying. Ah. Ah. Flip ah. it, egg. Ah. It is more scary, right? Because yeah. the engine is not on. I don't know why it is, but it is. I'm going 50 miles an hour. What? Flip it, egg. Ah. I'm, 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 break, I'm breaking, scared. I'm breaking, yeah, I'm breaking. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a heavy head 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 Oh my gosh! Oh, the snit! Flip, flip it out, Graham. <laughs> flip it out, you're going quick. 
<laughs> You're on the edge here. This is <laughs> scary. Right. You're doing well though on time though. I feel... This is quicker. I feel this is quicker, but I also feel scared. Get me that! You're going to be so close. Oh my god! Get me that! Go! Oh, we made it! What do we get? What do we get? 158. 158! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. This is wicked. This is such a cool thing. That is awesome. And you know what the wicked thing about it is? We did once um, go over the speed limit. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. And that is the beauty of the Mazda MX-5 Miata. You can feel like a Formula One driver. You can feel like you're maxing out the abilities of the car all whilst driving on the correct side of the road and below the speed limit. The body roll offered by the Roadster's ply and suspension means when travelling a corner at 30 miles per hour, you get the same level of thrill that you could only acquire at twice the speed in a super sports car. It's why the engine is so modest in its power figures. It doesn't need to be a fearsome V12 with blistering 0 to 60 figures to give you the time of your life. It simply needs to be like gravity, reliably taking you from one corner to the next and offering just a little push when necessary. After having a ball bowling down some steep mountain passes, we headed south, continuing our journey anti-clockwise around Ireland. Our plan was to go and discover the story behind why on earth there's a giant egg in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. However, a rather unfortunate event was about to put a dent in our day's itinerary. Graham promised breakfast after filming, and then it got too late for breakfast, so then he promised brunch. Then it got too late for brunch. Then he promised lunch. And it's a bit too late for lunch even now. Well, yeah, it is if we don't find somewhere soon. The boy's getting hangry. Getting a little hangry, yeah. Here we go. All I want is to eat! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to share one of the best things about the Mazda MX-5. The heater. Because... It just works. Richard, do you want to get really hot? Too hot, turn it off. Genuinely, straight away, my legs are burning from the heat. It's amazing. We get two boiling hot. Give it down. Ah, uh, air con. Air conditioning. Air conditioning works on this car as well. You can sit in traffic on a boiling hot day in this car and be comfortable. You can sit in traffic on a freezing cold day in this car and be comfortable. Damn impressive for such a small and cheap car. Sorry, yeah, I don't know why I'm turning it in front of the boiling. Flipping, pouring it down all flipping morning. It's like. Oh, you could mention actually how the um, aircon dial surrounds, isn't it? Standard? Yeah, it's like. <laughs> oh, what's that noise? Was that us? Oh. Was that us? Yeah, yeah, we've got no power. Uh, Engine stalled? No, oh, I don't know. Just hold right, on, hold okay, on, hold on. Is it hard shoulder it or something? Just like, I don't know. Bloody hell, bloody hell. Right, yeah, hard shoulder it or something. Okay, I think let's get him off the road. This busy road. Yeah. Just get him down there on the right, whatever that little road is. Yeah. And then maybe have to let him cool a bit and have a good rummage. Good... We'll have to look for someone to pull over around here, somewhere where we can stay a little longer if necessary. So bad things have just happened. We were driving down the main road, suddenly big squeal from the engine and the car cut out. Not good. The car starts and it's driving again and we have got tools with us. But I think what we're going to do is just see how the car goes if we take it back up to speed. We can't really afford to wait three hours for the car to cool down and then open up and try and figure out what's going on. If we can just calmly get the car to our next port of call, maybe then we'll be able to have time to have a better look. So, uh, tentative, tentative, tentatively, tentatively, so carefully stepping onwards. Bad. 
bad car. Actually, it wasn't really bad car, it was bad luck. Due to a lack of use, the MX-5's air conditioning compressor had deteriorated and, rather ironically, momentarily seized after our demonstration as to how well it works, causing a horrible squealing sound and the engine to stall. We laid off the AC and the car reverted to its prior, reliable self. Whilst we had our Japanese dependability back, the time we had lost couldn't be regained. We're back on the road, crisis averted, and we've realised that we're just going to have to use the alternative air conditioning method if we get a bit warm. The thing is, we're going to have to skip the giant egg in a field if we're going to have any chance of making it to our finishing point for the day. I really want to tell this story about this egg though, because it's a really good story. You see, it's the story of the first ever non-stop transatlantic flight. Uh, so I'm going to try and tell it to you from in the cabin here using a bunch of emergency props from the glove box. Uh, I hope this works out. <laughs> okay. So what is the story behind why a giant egg can be found sat in the middle of a soggy Irish field in the middle of nowhere? Well, it began somewhat like the film Rat Race, in which a wealthy fellow told a bunch of strangers to race across America, and the first to reach the finish line won $2 million. Except for in this real world scenario, in the year 1919, the wealthy fellow was the Daily Mail newspaper. The race was to fly 1,180 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, and the first place prize was £10,000, which equates to around about half a million pounds today. Much like in the film, many people wanted that money and glory, and therefore several planes were lined up on a small airfield right on the very east coast of Canada. One of those planes was flown by two gentlemen called Captain John Alcock and Lieutenant Arthur Witten Brown. They were flying a repurposed World War I bomber called a Vickers Vimy, and they were keen to win. So, whilst their competitors were testing and checking the integrity of their planes, Alcock and Brown skipped the safety stuff and took off. It proved almost catastrophic then and there. As upon takeoff, their plane nearly crashed into the tops of trees at the end of the runway as it struggled to gain altitude. Soon though, they were up and over the ocean. They weren't in the clear for long though, as whilst they had been predicted blue skies and sunshine, the flight proved harrowingly difficult. First, not long after takeoff, the plane's electricity generator failed, leaving them without heat, intercom, and most importantly, radio communications should they get into trouble. They were truly on their own. Three hours into their journey, they flew into a huge patch of fog. It was so thick they couldn't even see the tips of their wings. Alcock, who was piloting, couldn't even tell how fast he was flying or whether he was flying up or down. As a result, the plane climbed too high and slowed down too much causing it to stall and fall into an uncontrolled spin, hurtling towards a watery grave. The plane lost more than 4,000 feet, and when the Vickers bomber emerged from above the clouds, it was still losing altitude fast. Fortunately, with visibility restored at a lower altitude, Olcock was able to recover the plane, catching its fall just 15 meters above the sea. Things didn't get easier from there though. Fog turned into rain, which drenched the men from head to toe. And then came a snowstorm. The rain turned to ice, instruments on the plane froze up, and the men, without any source of warmth from their Vickers Vimy, almost did too. It's said that the engines even filled with snow and began to freeze up, and Brown had to climb out of his navigator's seat and scale the wings of the bomber to clear the iced up carburetors. Through this all, the exhaust on the plane failed, causing the Rolls-Royce engines to get louder and louder, 
the trim controller then broke, rendering the plane increasingly nose heavy as it burnt off fuel. One of the engines then iced up again, this time on the intake. Brown couldn't clear it out, so it had to be shut down, still over the freezing sea. The Atlantic Ocean threw everything it could at the experienced flyers and their plucky vicars, but it wasn't enough to stop them. In the distance, a green land appeared over the horizon. It was Ireland. Initially, Alcock and Brown had been aiming for London, but they and their plane had taken such a battering over the ocean, the two men decided to take victory and not continue to tempt fate. As the plane crossed over the Irish coast, Alcock turned off the Vickers' tired engines. The two men spotted a flat stretch of land upon which they could touch down, and they approached to settle the plane onto it. Little did they know though, what they had chosen was far from a suitable landing spot, as it was in fact an Irish bog. The bomber's wheels touched the sodden ground and they stuck fast. The plane was immediately tipped onto its nose and came to a halt with its tail in the air and its remaining fuel flooding into the cockpits and covering the weary adventurers. Alcock and Brown scrambled out of the plane and into the arms of locals who had rushed to the scene to assist the downed plane. The two men had survived and won the ultimate rat race. The men were knighted, received their winnings and became heroes with a story still remarkable today. And I found an excuse to buy these little foam plane things, which I haven't enjoyed since I was about eight. So I guess we're all winners here. Odd. No. Why? There's boring roads behind the boring Almera. <laughs> right, screw this. We need to go and find some decent roads. So we've had a change of plan. We were going to head west, but due to the little mishap with the car, we've decided to carry on south instead and just get ahead of ourselves in terms of miles. The advantage is we've now got it off the main road as a result onto some nice back roads the sun is finally shining and we can get the roof off the car so more fun he's happy again the day had been spent barreling around rain-soaked hairpins in the morning, accidentally missing meals, feeling the anxiety of a reliability scare, and tortured by far too many slow, tedious motorway miles. It's safe to say that on the second stretch of our trip, both Ireland and our MX-5 had shown us the range of emotions they can instill in one's mind. So it was truly appreciated when, at the tail end of what had been a roller coaster day of driving, we were greeted with some welcome respite. The landscape opened into a scene of expansive flatness, thickly dusted with limestone rock. It makes for a place that looks like the site of an ancient lost city, yet also looks too barren to sustain any form of civilized life. Suddenly, our journey was no longer about reaching our destination as quickly as possible, nor was its purpose to thrill us with degrees upon degrees of twisting tarmac. Now we were driving to relax, to enjoy the views around us and to breathe in crisp, clean countryside air. It was a drive our MX-5 Miata was more than happy to shoulder, quietly and unintrusively purring along the stretched, straight roads, undertaking the role of a courier to its occupants and providing a conduit to the outside world, as opposed to shunning it with theatre or playfulness. If you ask it to, the MX-5 Miata is more than happy to play second fiddle to the wonders around it. And in this era of constantly crackling exhausts, loud angular shapes and cluttered confusing cabins, that's an old car feature that deserves some commendation in this modern world. 
What this meant was that as we arrived in the heart of County Clare, even though it was dark and we were shattered after being on the road for 14 hours, we were also surprisingly relaxed, in good spirits, and all in all becoming rather fond of this district we found ourselves in. But not everything created in County Clare is good. So after miles upon miles of lush countryside scenery, we stopped at a roundabout in the middle of the suburbs to mention one of Ireland's least loved creations and exports. We made it to County Clare, eventually. And to celebrate, we're stood in the middle of a roundabout. But that's because I want to demonstrate something. County Clare is full of so many interesting and cool things. It's got beautiful scenery, it's got hella good waves. It's the home of the inventor of the submarine, if you know. It was visited by Muhammad Ali. There's a statue to him right here. It's got loads of greatness about it. And yet, the story I want to tell today is not about a great person. It's actually about a bit of a scoundrel. His name was Colonel Thomas Blood. He was born here in County Clare. We think he was born here in County Clare. Some people say that, others argue he was actually born in Dublin. It doesn't matter any anyway, because he's not famous for where he was born. He's famous for what he did over in London. So I'm going to tell you the story of Colonel Thomas Blood, the only person ever to steal the crown jewels. Colonel Thomas Blood had no reason to be the rogue lawbreaker that he was. He was born into a well-off family and his grandfather was actually a lawmaker as he worked in Parliament. It could be said that he eased himself into being a bit dishonest. At 24 years old, he went to England to fight for King Charles I against Oliver Cromwell. However, when he realised King Charles was going to lose the war, Thomas Blood switched sides. And because he fought oh so gallantly and loyally for the winning side, he received a large English estate as a thank you gift from Oliver Cromwell. Oh, I should point out, during all this, Thomas Blood decided he was going to start calling himself Colonel Thomas Blood. It wasn't a title he earned or was awarded, he just liked the way it sounded. Anyway, some years later, back in Ireland, Thomas Blood was a bit miffed. You see, it turns out in that war before, he'd kind of chosen the wrong side after all. King Charles's son, also named Charles, was in power and wasn't best pleased with the folk who had fought against, captured and beheaded his father. As a result, Blood had fled his freebie estate and England and was back in his homeland. He was poor, peeved and looking for a way to really annoy the new King Charles II. Do you know what is super annoying? Having your stuff stolen. I remember when I was about seven years old I had this set of coloured pencils. They had little F1 cars indented on them and they were my pride and joy. I'd keep them in my desk at school and only use them on very special occasions. I wasn't a particularly cool kid. Anyway, one day I came back to class after lunch to find someone had nicked my pencils. I was furious, not just because they were mine, but also because I'd spent a load of time the previous evening sharpening all of my pencils until they were absolutely perfect and ready to be used. This sharpening is exactly what King Charles II had done. Not with 90 pence worth of pencils, but with the crown jewels. As he had just spent £32,000 remaking and remastering the ceremonial regalia. £32,000 in 1670 is the same as about £7 million or so today, so it was quite an investment. And Thomas Blood thought it's going to make Charles pretty damn furious if someone takes the new and improved crown jewels. So Blood cobbled together a plan. I think cobbled together is a fair way of saying it. After partaking in two botched kidnapping attempts prior to this, where Blood and his accomplices twice tried to storm Dublin Castle and capture colleagues of the King, I think it's safe to say Colonel Thomas Blood didn't operate with the stroke of a criminal mastermind. But sometimes, fortune favours the bold. Blood donned a disguise, adopted a false name and swaggered back to London, pretending to be a righteous and honest church official. 
he enlisted the help of a local actress to pose as his wife and headed off to the Tower of London, where the crown jewels were and are still to this day being held under lock, key and guard. Thomas Blood and his fake wife arrived at the tower as tourists, asking to see their beloved king's famous new bling. The jewels keeper let them in, and when viewing the Crown and Co, Blood's plan sprang into action. His actress wife faked a sudden onset of illness, rendering her in apparent agony, and the jewel keeper, being an actually decent fellow, invited her and Blood to his apartment, which was in the tower, in order to give her assistance and help her recover. Part one of the plan was a success. After recovering from her fake ailment, Thomas Blood and his wife overflowed with gratitude towards the Jewel Keeper for his help, and Blood began to nurture a friendship with the guard, lavishing the Keeper's wife with gifts and such. Blood would regularly visit the Keeper's apartment until he was sure of the best route in and out of the tower, and until he was certain he had gained the absolute trust of the Keeper. At this point, the cunning Mr. Blood suggested that he could also help the Keeper's unmarried daughter, by suggesting she marry his nephew, who was said to be worth rather a lot of money. This of course was all made up. However, the Keeper didn't know this, and was delighted at the thought of marrying his daughter to a wealthy suitor, and agreed to the union on the spot. Part 2 of the plan was a success. A few days later, Thomas Blood dropped by the tower once more. However, this time he had with him his wealthy nephew and a couple of friends who had joined to help officiate the meeting between the two suitors. However, this rich nephew was in fact Blood's son, and the two friends were accomplices, all armed with concealed daggers and pistols. Thomas Blood himself had even managed to smuggle in a big old wooden mallet underneath his clothing. Whilst everyone was chatting and getting along well, Blood lightly suggested that the group go and catch a glimpse of the famous Crown Jewels, and the Keeper, eager to entertain his new friends and soon-to-be son-in-law, agreed. The group headed off, along a passageway, down a flight of stairs, up a corridor, and onwards until they came across a large reinforced door, behind which was displayed the Crown Jewels. The Keeper takes out his key, unlocks the door, and pushes it open. At that point, all hell breaks loose. The four perpetrators dive on the Keeper. Thomas Blood withdraws his mallet and bludgeons the Keeper on the head, knocking him down. Blood then stabs the guard in the stomach for good measure. Once the Keeper was subdued, the men moved on to the jewels. Now, crowns have never exactly been a part of regular fashion even in the 1600s, so sneaking it out intact was going to be impossible. Therefore, Thomas's mallet was once again put to good use, and the crown was bashed repeatedly until it was as flat as a plate. The next jewel to deal with was the Sovereign's Orb. This was easier, as Blood figured this big golden ball could be kept where balls are often stashed, down one's underwear. Finally, they moved on to the scepter, this was a difficult one. It was too long to covertly carry, so the men had to go about cutting it in half to create two easy-to-hide chunks. All of this cutting, bashing, and stashing took too long, though. Rather than dying from his wounds, the jewels keeper instead regained consciousness and managed to yell for help. At this point, Thomas Blood and his accomplices sprinted out of the tower and towards their awaiting horses, which were their getaway vehicles. However, the Keeper's call for help had done enough. Within moments, the thieves were tackled to the ground, apprehended, and dragged back into the tower in chains. So Thomas Blood is recorded as the only person to ever steal the English crown jewels. He just didn't get away with it. Well, he didn't get away with the jewels anyway, because he did get away with committing the crime. Just how charming do you have to be to get caught committing a crime that should send you to the hangman, but instead be gifted £500 a year by the very man you are stealing from? Well, apparently being about as charming as Colonel Thomas Blood will do it. You see, Thomas Blood announced to his captors that he would speak to no one other than the king himself, 
And when given the king's audience, he retold the story as to just how he'd managed to get so close to stealing Charles II's most prized possessions, throwing the king a few compliments along the way to appeal to his vanity. And Charles was so damn impressed and entertained by the story that he not only pardoned Thomas Blood for his treasonous crime, but also awarded him a load of land in Ireland worth £500 a year. Mind you, after all of this, Colonel Thomas Blood never was considered fully trustworthy again. To the point, in fact, that even after he had died and been buried, the government dug up his body just to check he was indeed dead, and not just faking it to avoid paying the tons of debt he had amounted over the years. And that's why, in a place full of greatness, Perhaps the coolest thing to come out of County Clare in Ireland is a talented, lucky, daft, completely untrustworthy scoundrel. Okay, Richard, let's go eat food. Breakfast time. Thanks for watching episode two. Be sure to tune into episode three, where we discuss the Mazda MX-5 Miata MA's weakest features, tell the story of Ireland's only ever Formula One team, and go in search of the country's greatest driving roads. In the meantime, please do consider subscribing to my channel, as it would be great to have you along for this journey. Thanks.